Here is one of a series of talks by spiritual leader Lola McDowell Lee, spanning two decades from the early 70s through the 90s. Lola was a Zen Roshi, whose Rinzai lineage included Dr. Henry Plutov and renowned Zen master Shigetsu Sasaki. Lola was a religious scholar as well as an ordained Christian minister. While the talks are focused mainly on Zen and Buddhism, Lola drew on many spiritual traditions, including those of Jesus, Plato, Lao Tzu, the Hindu Vedas, Meister Eckhart, and Gurdjieff. The Buddha said, Those who follow the way are like unto warriors who fight single-handed with a multitude of foes. They may all go out of the fort in full armor, but among them are some who are faint-hearted and some who go halfway and beat a retreat and some who are killed in the affray and some who come home victorious. O monks, if you desire to attain enlightenment, you should steadily walk in your way with a resolute heart with courage and should be fearless in whatever environment you may happen to be and destroy every evil influence that you may come across for thus you shall reach the goal that's what he said now this man named Gautama the Buddha was a very practical, pragmatic, rational, logical man. He wasn't interested in abstractions or philosophy or metaphysics. And when the story goes, the legend has it, that when he became the Buddha, Brahman, you know, the god of the gods in India, came to him and asked him, who is your witness? You know, everyone, when they have uh, attained even glimpses, you know, one has a witness there too. Somebody you go and say it to, tell it to, so that you will know whether or not it was authentic. Hmm? Who is your witness? Brahman asked the Buddha. And Buddha laughed and he touched the earth and he said, this earth. This very earth is my witness. Not the sky, and not the sun, and not the moon, and not the stars, but this very earth. His whole approach is like that, you know? It's earthy, and it's rooted. You know, there's not a lot of pie in the sky, what it's called, hmm? Imaginations. This very earth. You know, indicating he stood on the source. Hmm? This very earth. And now, when he started to teach, because he wasn't going to, and then um, he was persuaded because uh, so many people needed to hear what he had to say. So he went out and founded a sangha. And... Um, then he gave his teachings, which started with the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And it's the Eightfold Path that we're going to talk about a little bit today. Now, the division of eight, the eight steps, you know, that you're supposed to deal with. The division of eight is arbitrary. Actually, they are all meshed together so that you can hardly tell in some instances, one from the other. Because the way, of course, as we all know, is not divided. The earth is not divided. Hmm? But so that we could understand a little easier, he spoke of these eight steps and he tr broke them down. Uh, you know, actually all of us are standing on the way this very earth 
uh, the only criteria of the whole thing being, are we aware of it? Or is your mind wandering? Now, um, the first step, the first so-called division, is named right view, the correct view. And all of these steps are concerned with right. There's right intentions, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and then the ultimate, the right concentration or right meditation or right samadhi, however you want to say it. Hmm? Now, this word right has been translated from the Sanskrit, uh, from the word uh, samyak, uh, or as they, in, in uh, Ceylon they would say, sama, samaditi <coughs> is, is right view. And right really is a very poor translation. Because if we look at this, we say right, then it seems to us as if right is opposed to something wrong. So you've got a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And that's not what's intended. It's, it's not a fight against anything. You know, wrongs are many. You know, right is one. You know, like health is one and diseases are many. Hmm? Yeah. We can go on inventing wrongs, and we do. Oh, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, you know. It's not my way of thinking, so it's wrong. But right cannot be invented. Right is something that you must know, experience. Hmm? And that kind of right that you experience doesn't depend on you and your mind and your inventions. Hmm? When everything is in harmony, it's right. Right already is. You don't invent it. You're either in that place of harmony or you're not. If you move away from this harmony, you just lose it. And when you're one with it, you are perfectly right. You're wholesome. So it means then this word right, it means in a way balanced a balanced view, it means a centered view, it means a grounded view, it means harmonious view, it means a tranquil view, a correct view. They are all correct, you know, when the one is. Okay? So we can use the word right now and you'll know sort of what it means. Instead of it doesn't mean against the wrong, it means balanced. So we have a balanced view, a right view. And to have a, a balanced view a means to look at things without any opinion. Because as soon as you have opinion, you're lopsided. So you look at the world without any philosophy, without any prejudice, and without any creed. You just look. You look at things as they are, you know, they say green is green and yellow is yellow and, <clears throat> and yellow is not opposed to green and green is not opposed to yellow. Why should you bother with it? You look. Hmm? So don't create a lot of fictions. You go to this reality, to this balancedness, to this centeredness, to this groundedness, you go to it without any beliefs. You're shorn. Uh, belief usually is a barrier. You can miss what you're seeking because it doesn't look like what you believed it should look. See, your belief has cut you off. Uh, belief belongs to the ego. It belongs to the conditioning. And we've all seen this. We know this pretty well. If you've looked at yourself with any understanding at all, you've seen it. You know, if somebody comes in here and they're born as a Hindu, <clears throat> they're conditioned from their childhood by that belief in that surround. 
in that environment. And the same applies to Mohammedans and to Christians and to Jews and to Jains and to communists. Yeah. The whole of humanity is in a way a victim of a school of this or a school of that or that idealism or that pragmatism or with this prejudice or that belief. Now, if you're born a Hindu and you have been so conditioned, when you start this meditation business, it could be that you might see a vision of Krishna or of Rama. It does happen. You know, they speak about this little blue man, Krishna. Hmm? That's why my door is painted blue, huh? Krishna consciousness. <laughs> I didn't know that. Somebody told me that the other day. <laughs> I never associated it. Yeah. But you see, if you, you may have visions of Krishna if you're a Hindu, but Christ will never come to you. Christ comes to Christians. Krishna doesn't come to Christians. Huh? Buddha comes to Buddhists. Buddha doesn't come to a Christian. No. And to a communist, nobody comes. <laughs> no. Because he believes that religion is nonsense. It's an opiate for the people. It's a dangerous poison to be, you know, get rid of it. So nobody comes. Hmm? <clears throat> if you have an opinion, a belief, you know, uh, without your being aware of it, unless you are extremely aware, you will impose that opinion on whatever, even on the truth. You will change it to fit yourself. That opinion or that prejudice that you have. Belief finds that which it wants to find, true or not. Hmm? Belief also is very selective. Hmm? Just the senses are very selective. Hmm? So is belief. The mind is selective, the thinking. Hmm? Out of all the stream of thoughts, and they are multitudinous that go through your mind, you pick and choose which ones you want. Now, if you look at yourself very good, why well, you can, especially when you're doing nothing else in the meditation period, you could watch this, you know. <laughs> huh? How selective we are in everything. You know, there was a young boy who was brought into court again and he was charged with stealing hubcaps. And the judge, seeing him there again, decided to appeal to the father. And so said the judge, see here, this boy of yours has been in court many times, and he's charged with theft, and I'm tired of seeing him here. I don't blame you, judge, said the father. I'm just as tired of seeing him here as you are. Well, and why don't you teach him how he should act? You know, show him the right way so he won't be coming here anymore. Well, said the father, I have already shown him the right way, but he just doesn't seem to have a talent for learning. He always gets caught. <laughs> you see, this right view... <laughs> the right view for the judge and the right view for the father. And that's how we run around. Hmm? There are two different things. For the father, his view is a right view, and for the judge, his view is a right view. Now, be very careful that you don't do this <coughs> type of thing with the Buddha's right view. Hmm? Yeah. Right view we could also say is right understanding. And it implies that we have seen through the delusion that material security automatically brings peace of mind. It doesn't. 
There are a great many people with lots of money, and they're terribly insecure. They need to be babied. Hmm? Also, this right understanding implies that you don't look at ceremonies and rituals that they can wipe out all the effects of everything that you've been through. Hmm? That you can go and pray and, and everything is washed clean. Hmm? So the first right, this right view or right understanding is based on the content of the mind. The content of the mind. To know the content of the mind, one must stop thinking mechanically and begin to question our previous assumptions. Until we have a view that is based on the understanding of this world as it is, things as they are. Things as they are are impermanent, and we have the effects of desire and greed and prejudice, which we call suffering, misery, and that in the final analysis, everything is non-ego. Yeah. It's a pretty good way of looking at the world, isn't it? Yeah, right view. You know, so much of our lives depend on how we look at things. You know, we, we condition ourselves by how we look at things. This is a no-no, and, and we think for some odd reason or another, and so we shy away from it and go into something that maybe isn't even good for us. But, you know, we, we, we condition ourselves. We interpret what somebody else says, and it's all wrong, 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 erroneous, wrong. See? You know, and there was this little village where they, they brought a blind man. Buddha happened to be passing through this little village, and so they brought this blind man to him. And the people of the village were at their wits' ends with this blind man. <clears throat> they were tired of him. He was very logical and very philosophical and very argumentative, and they were tired of it because they did have to help him because he was blind. But he was always trying to prove that light did not exist. Yeah. He would say, well, bring it to me. I would like to touch it. No? Bring it to me. I would like to taste it. Hmm? Bring it to me. I would like to smell it. You know? Bring it to me so I can beat on it like a drum so that I can hear it. No. Well, of course, you can't do that. Hmm? You can't beat on light, and you can't taste it. See, and then this blind man would laugh and he'd say, you know, you're a bunch of fools. You, know, you can't prove what you're saying. You're not logical. You know. They were dealing with something that didn't exist. So they brought this man to the Buddha. And they thought that the Buddha would convince him that there was light. But the Buddha said, don't bring him to me. Hmm? But I do know a physician. Somebody had assigned a physician, a very fine physician, to the, take care of the Buddha. So the, the Buddha said, take him to that man, because this, this man doesn't, the blind man doesn't need to be convinced. What he needs is to see light. Huh? He needs eyes. He needs treatment. Hmm? And so they took this blind man to the physician, and he, the, the physician treated him for six months, and then he was able to see. And of course, by this time, the Buddha was long gone to some other village, you know. And in this other village, now here comes this man. He's running to the Buddha. He's ecstatic, you know, and he falls at the Buddha's feet. And he says, you have convinced me. There is light, you know. To which the Buddha replied, don't talk nonsense. Hmm? I haven't done anything. Your own eyes have convinced you. <laughs> and there is no other way. Yeah. The old saying, you know, a woman convinced against her will is of the same opinion still. <laughs> <laughs> I don't 
don't know why they lump that on the women, but it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Works for men, too. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you know, this Buddha person, he didn't talk very much about what you're going to see. No. What he did talk about was our blindness and how to get out of that blindness. What you will see is what all the patriarchs down the line have seen when you see. So the thing is to get out of the blindness. Hmm? I don't know, I've got a story here and I don't know whether to tell it or not. Anyway, this woman, <laughs> You know, because we look at this world and everything is fine until something doesn't fit with our ideas, you know. And so this woman had heard about a particular preacher uh, who was supposed to give marvelous sermons. Everybody was so excited about him, so she went. And there was a, a time in, during the lecture where he went through the Ten Commandments. And after every one, why, uh, the congregation would say, Amen. And she joined in with them, you know. So here comes this, thou shalt not kill, and everybody, Amen. You know, thou shalt not steal, Amen. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, Amen. Thou shalt not commit adultery. <laughs> Now he's beginning to middle. <laughs> See? <laughs> they seem, you, you people are all asleep today. <laughs> hmm? You know, we act as if. We think as if. We feel as if we are the touchstone of truth. Hmm? As if we are the criterion of it all. The moment it doesn't fit you, it's all wrong. Hmm? And this is an incorrect approach. And if you hold to this approach, you will never arrive at that which is real because it will be wrong. God has no obligation to fit with your ideas. Hmm. Reality itself has no obligation to fit in with your point of view, because your point of view comes from the ego. Hmm. So a man of right understanding will change so that he can merge in with the true nature. Hmm? Now the second step is right intent, or we could call it a correct motive. Uh, the first step is concerned with the content of the mind. Huh? Now comes the quality of the drive behind that, you know, so we could say it's emotional rather than thinking. Uh, and so people have struggled to a more correct view, but the emotional drive behind these views may not be what they are supposed to be. It is possible to be driven by an unrecognized fear of involvement. Hmm? So, and in, if one is in this Buddhist teaching, it's very easy to say, you know, all is impermanent. Then I don't have to be involved. Hmm? Uh, there in some is a pathological inability to enjoy oneself. And so one can very readily understand, well, all is suffering. Hmm? And the doctrine that there is no personal identity Hmm? 
finds favor with those who never succeed in forming a satisfactory relationship, either with somebody else or with themselves. So this step implies the uncovering of these unrecognized drives. That is, it's weeding out ourselves to our roots. Now, people all over the world pray. What do they pray for? They pray for help. And we find ourselves helpless very often. Uh, they pray for their desires. They pray for their intent, their motives. It's like the little man who prayed to God, and he said, you know, I'm always praying to you, God. Mm -hmm. And yet, I have had nothing but bad luck. I have had despair and misery all my life, and I'm always praying to you. Look at the butcher next door. He's never prayed in his life at all, and he has nothing but prosperity and health and joy. Hmm? How come a believer like me is always in trouble and he is always doing so well? And all of a sudden there's this big booming voice in this man's ear and he says, because the butcher is not always bugging me. <laughs> that was easier for you, huh? So looking at the drive, you're looking at the motive, how we're motivated, by what are we motivated, huh? And rooting that out, we begin to live with the moment. And when you live with the moment, it comes out all right. Surprising, it comes out all right. Because moment to moment is very spontaneous and responsible. Responsible, the ability to respond. Responsible. You respond to the moment, not to all these incorrect views and beliefs that you have brought in, just the moment. And when there is uh, incorrect motive, you know, we are in tension. Yeah. You are here now. You're not going anywhere. You're not chasing anything. So one is free of self-limiting interests. You're not going anywhere. There is nowhere to go. You are there now already. All you have to do is be aware of it. And if there's nowhere to go, you're not chasing anything. To stop the mind wandering. And the third step is right speech. You see, you practice these all at one time. You don't do one until you got that down perfect, you feel, and then do the next one until you got that down perfect. You do them all at the same time. They're not really, as I said, divisions. <clears throat> Right speech. Say only that which is. Say what is true and what is real, which you know through your own experience. Don't be fictitious. Be honest and be authentic. <clears throat> you know, the Buddha was asked a great many questions. Everybody that came to him had a question. And many of them he wouldn't answer, and I don't blame him. He should have heard some of mine. <clears throat> Dumb. He wouldn't answer him. He'd say, what for? You know, people would ask, well, who created the world? And his answer would be, what difference does it make? Hmm? Why don't you ask a question that can be of some help to you? Who created the world isn't going to help you any. That's too abstract. You know, 
and somebody says, God invented the world, created the world. Invented is a good way to put it. And another adds, oh yeah, he did, and he did it in six days. And then somebody else comes along and says, well, he's still creating it. And the creation is continuing. It has never been finished. And so they, now these people all have a, a reason for quarreling. You know, he created and then he rested. I guess he's been resting ever since. <laughs> or maybe these people just want to fight, and any excuse will do. You know? And they are beautiful excuses because there's no way to prove them or end them. How are you going to prove that God created the world? Or how are you going to prove that God is still creating the world? And of course, there are people today who ask who created God. And that's, that one we can answer. And of course, there are people who talk and 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 never say anything. Because, you know, words have a charm all their own. Hmm? I have seen it. I have sat there and watched somebody more than once do this thing. They're on the telephone and they say certain things and it just something that popped out of their mouths uh, without their thinking about it, something that may have heard or something that the mind put together at the moment or whatever. But they hear themselves say these certain things and then they believe what they say. Oh, this is actual now, you know. These words have a charm. You're hypnotized by them. Hmm? You know, if your neighbor comes and leans over the fence with some gossip, you listen rather attentively. Hmm? We do. Yeah. If that same neighbor throws some trash in your yard, you start quarreling with him to get it out. He throws trash and rubbish in your head and you welcome it. Hmm? What are you going to do with all this rubbish you're carrying around? Hmm? Sooner or later, it comes out of the mouth. Now, if you see that you've got some rubbish, go to the forest, go to the ocean, you talk to the trees, talk to the birds, talk to the water, talk to the fish. You can unburden yourself all over the place. You can just unwind with this marvelous sounding board. Huh? The trees aren't going to listen. Huh? And the birds don't take it on. So that's the way you do it. You don't, you're not throwing rubbish around. Right speech means sincere speech. Uh, some of you I know here have been on a fast. And uh, you will remember that after the first day, hunger has a very different feel about it than if you're just hungry and it's the next meal is coming up. But after a day without any food, uh, hunger has a different feel to it. Few days more, and there is a new kind of an aliveness to hunger. It's quite different, huh? And it's the same with words. Keep silent. Hmm? Then when you say something, somehow the talking has a power in it. Hmm? If you really want that your words should have power, you know, value, Look at what kind of word you use, and then learn silence. Then you will learn what right speech is. Conversation should be a means of coming to know others, and so as to understand them, and ourselves in that particular set of circumstances. Conversation should not be just interrupted monologues. Okay? And the fourth one is right action, or sometimes called morality. Morality should come from within. Right action should come from within. And it should be balanced, centered, 
You're not with any conditioning. Uh, because generally we act because it is our duty or that we have to follow a certain rule. But now you're going to do it because you are conscious. You're aware. Yeah? Realizing the suchness of mind, you act. Yeah? Waning said the mind should be framed in such a way that it will be independent of external or internal objects, at liberty to come and go, free from attachment. That doesn't mean throwing this away and saying, I'm not attached to it. The mind, the mind is what we're talking about. huh? To do something with the right action, not out of fear. One does not act out of fear, but out of understanding. Hmm? Not because of greed should one be moral, and one should do it for a reward or out of fear of punishment. But, you know, we have been brought up with a great deal of that in this country. After all, we have a puritanical background, simply because we live in this country. Yeah? Well, it was during a religious meeting, a big revival, and uh, it was packed in the church and all the balcony. They were all, it was all filled. And everybody was very excited, you know, how they get in the evangelical thing. And this young widow, she's quite attractive, she leaned too far over the balcony and she fell. And her dress caught on the chandelier, and it held her suspended in midair. <laughs> you know, and the preacher, you know, immediately noticed the woman's predicament, and he called out to the whole congregation, you know, the first person who looks up there is in danger of being punished with blindness. <laughs> you know? But our little monk is sitting there, and he whispered to the man next to him, I think I will risk one eye. <laughs> you know, it's how we do things. We're <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> this is our conditioning, you know, and it, it, it's kind of, uh, it's an enforced action that we have, so it can't be total. There's always a little toe left out someplace, or the finger is out here or something. Where it's not total. But right action proceeds from an unobstructed mind. It's free to come and go. Huh? It's free from attachment. Okay? Now, the fifth step is right livelihood. Uh, livelihood, of course, is based on needs. We need money. It's our barter system. We need food and shelter and clothes, the basics. Hmm? But we don't have to earn this money in a violent fashion. We don't have to kill for it. Uh, so right livelihood, or correct livelihood, means that we select a job that will use our potential talents. Hmm? that will help us to see our weak points so that we can get rid of them. You can't get rid of anything until you've seen it. Hmm? And it certainly doesn't mean live in poverty. Don't make any money. You know, that's living in poverty. And because then I'm living right according to I don't know who. But, you know, make money! Lots of it! <laughs> <laughs> do it with the rest of them. But at the same time, you watch your motives for what you're doing, and your thinkings, and your feelings. Right livelihood, you know, is weighing our attributes. Right livelihood, we have a kind of an attitude uh, that we are taking a place in a community, 
in a, maybe a small community, maybe a larger community or whatever, and being of service to that community. Now, and through that community then, to the whole. Hmm? It is doing your part in this whole. And the service, we don't need to be selective, you know, about what you think about what you're serving or who you're serving or whatever. Your being of service in a community is a right livelihood. Hmm? Uh, Jocelyn paints, that's a right livelihood. She is of service to people who enjoy painting. Rosalind is of service because she is dealing with flowers, and flowers uh, are pleasurable. I mean, it's pleasurable. Pleasure is, is something in this world. You know, you, because it's pleasurable, mm -hmm. you know. So Willie is in service. He does printing. That's a service to the community. It keeps the whole thing moving. Ruth is a service. Hmm? She serves the community within the whole. And, and even though the people are um, <clears throat> wealthy uh, and uh, insecure, you know, it doesn't mean that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they have a place. Everything has a place. You have a place, so-called, you know, where you can serve. So do it, and do it right, without a lot of prejudices in there. Hmm? So then we can learn to cope and consider how and why we are spending our working hours. Work we need to do, so do it right. <clears throat> I mean, to take the time to think and find a means of occupation that will benefit, is beneficial to others, somehow. You don't all have to run out and be nurses or doctors and that sort of thing, you know. But some benefit to somebody. And the kind of work at which we are employed, if we have the right action, within the, the right livelihood, it helps us in the final analysis in our search for right understanding. Because you're looking at yourself, your own foibles. Yeah. And the sixth is right effort. And within this right effort, we have four categories. There is in here the effort to disabuse ourselves of unwholesome states that have already risen. And then we have the effort to uh, prevent the rising of unwholesome states that have not yet arisen. And then we have the effort to preserve wholesome states that have arisen. And then there is the effort to encourage wholesome states that have not yet arisen. Mm -hmm. Keep you busy, boy. Because <laughs> you know I'm barely skimming on the surface of this thing. Right effort, the development of insight, of intuition, and willpower. Yeah. We need insight to perceive which states of mind habitually are present which we should preserve, and which are to be weeded out. Hmm? Right effort is primarily concerned with the development of the will. The seventh <coughs> step, I'm getting there. The seventh step is right mindfulness. Right mindfulness, that's to be full of mind. Yeah, not just thinking about it. To be full of mind. If you, we were using Christian terminology, it might be translated as practicing the presence of God. 
mind. Hmm? It implies extending, gradually of course, extending one's awareness in every action, in every thought and every word, until all of that is performed in the full light of consciousness. And then you move. You always try to move with sharp consciousness, clear consciousness. Hmm? And first we become mindful of the body. Rarely do we actually live in the body. We're in here someplace, <coughs> flying around. How often are you really aware of the movement of your body? Hmm? Your arms and your legs and your eyes and your ears. Hmm? The interplay of the muscles, the breath, the sound impinging on the eardrum without stopping to pass judgment. Hmm? Letting them rise and letting them go. Aware of taste and texture of food. These things you do all day long with this. Be mindful. And there is mindfulness of feeling, emotional reactions to pleasure and to pain, or even to indifference. So don't be mechanistic about this. You know, it's through the day. Yeah. We need only watch, you know, the rising and the passing of feelings without trying to hold on to it or to name it. Mindfulness of mind. Watch. Don't tamper with it. Just watch it. Look at what thoughts are passing through out of the multitude. And then see through them the mind itself. Mindfulness of mind. And then mindfulness of effects. Unpleasant feelings. Angry feelings. Suffering. And as one mood replaces another, notice the impermanence of the moods, of the thoughts. Hmm. Be mindful of some aspect of the teaching. Non-ego, impermanence. You know, what is your suffering really? Mindful of effects. And then number eight is right concentration or right meditation, and sometimes by some called right samadhi. It has been said that the mind is like a pool. A pool up in the mountains, you know, nothing can disturb it. But too often we allow it to be agitated and muddy. In fact, so often that we don't know it's a pool. Right meditation is to quieten the mind until it becomes perfectly still. To hold the mind until it is perfectly still. And then all the deep recesses, little by little, deeper and deeper, can be seen. So then one is totally absorbed in the center of existence. And if, you know, if you're sitting and you fall into unconsciousness, that's not correct meditation. Meditation is total awareness. One should not fall into a dreamlike state and call it samadhi, however pleasant it is. We, we can put ourselves into very blissful states, as it were, and uh, it's not meditation. <clears throat> Ordinarily, we live outside. Uh, you understand that, don't you? That we live outside. You live in the world. You live outside. You're always moving out. You're going out. You live outside. Huh? 
Then one day, it's like all of a sudden you stand on your head and you change the process and you forget all about the outside and what you've got now is inside. All the stuff is no longer going out there, it's going on in here. And you see what is really happening, huh? Yeah. It's a necessary step. Uh, you know, if you were a monk in training, you would be required to live in that state for three months. There is only inside. Then you would be required to live in a state of there is only outside. And it's quite an experience. Yeah. But it's not samadhi. Not right samadhi. Mm -mm. We come to this phrase, you know, nirvana and samsara are two sides of the coin. They're the same. They're one. Hmm? No in, no out. Correct meditation, or if you want to say samadhi, transcends that duality. Hui Ning, you know, he was a sixth patriarch, and I like him very much. And he says, let your mind be in a state such as that of the illimitable void, but do not attach to it the idea of vacuity. Let it function freely, whether you are in activity or at rest. Let your mind abide nowhere. Forget discrimination between sage and ordinary man. Ignore the distinction of subject-object. Let the essence of mind and all phenomenal objects be in a state of thusness. Then you will be in samadhi. So as the Buddha said, those who follow the way are like unto warriors who fight single-handed with a multitude of foes. They may all go out of the fort in full armor, but among them are some who are faint-hearted, some who will go halfway, and some who are killed in the affray, and some who will come home victorious. You should walk steadily in your way with a resolute heart, with courage, and should be fearless in whatever environment you may happen to be. Then you will reach the goal. And now, may the peace and the power that passeth all understanding hold us and keep us in the love of the Christed consciousness while we are seemingly separate one from another. And I thank you very much. If you find Lola's talks valuable, more will be posted in weeks to come.